welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We are grateful, Lord, that we haven't come to hear from a man or woman, but we've come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that we that you would have us to be, Lord. And we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We would ask that you bless them, Father. We would ask that you bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals and Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. Thank you for the way, Lord, and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia Church, all these churches, Lord, that are preaching the gospel. They're our brothers and sisters. We're co-laborers working in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Well, get your Bibles and let's go to the word of the Lord together tonight. You know, I've been meditating something for the last few days that I thought was fascinating. You know, my job and every pastor that gets in this pulpit area is to get God. Now, are you going to hear me? Are you going to listen? To get God so big on the inside of you that God becomes bigger than any problem you ever have. And therefore you have a confidence on the inside of you that helps you to get past the problem and get into the blessings of the Lord. That's called faith. Have a faith in a big God. I've said it many times. A lot of people have a small God, small G. And they have a relationship with God, but God's not very big. God's a very little God to them. All their problems in life and all their trials and all their tribulations and the world conditions and the world situations are bigger to them than, if you will, who God really is. My job and every pastor that gets in a pulpit anywhere, their job is to get God so big in you that when the problems of life arise, and may I say this to you, they will arise. They'll arise in your marriage. They'll arise with your children. They'll arise with your finances. The problems will arise. Anybody can attest to this. Arise with your relatives. They will arise in every area of your life. But when they arise, God is so big that you can go right through these times of trouble and problems and pressures because you know with confidence that your God has got it all under control. And the way to get God big inside of you is to build a confidence level on the inside of you so that when you hear of a problem, see of a situation, have a trial in your life, you immediately go right to where you need to be, and that's where God's at, where God blesses you in every area of your life. And that's so great when that happens, but very few times does that ever really happen in Christian's life. Problems arise, they fall apart, trials come, they bellyache to God, they got bawling and squalling down real good instead of walking in faith and confidence that'll bring an end to the problem. They're bawling and squalling before God, begging before God, because their God is not very big. So I want to make God tonight just a little bit bigger in your heart so when you walk out of this place tonight, you're going to know assuredly, have a confidence that you can face whatever situation it is. We're going to share something from the word of the Lord tonight. I love this. It's called the I wills of Jesus. If I know what Jesus says I will do, I will do this, I will do that. I know it. it's the will of God that we can do something. We can believe God. We can have confidence in what God says that he can do. There's a number of things that Jesus says I will do for you. 
I will do, I will do that for that person, I will do this. He was asked numerous times about doing something and he would come up with this kind of an answer, I will do that. Boy, I tell you, when you see that Jesus will do that, my Bible says, so does yours, that he's not a respecter of men, that he doesn't treat one one way and treat another some other way. If he'll treat them that way, he'll treat you that way. And if he will do that for them, he will do it for you. It builds confidence on the inside of you as how great your God is. Anybody listening tonight? And so we want to go to the word of the Lord. We're going to the New Testament, and we're going to be looking at uh, the I wills of Jesus. Let me explain to you again about confidence. Very important that you have confidence with God because the Bible says when you boldly approach the throne of grace, you can't approach the throne of grace where God's at, belly aching, bawling, squalling forever. You've got to grow up sometime and get to the place where you know your rights in Jesus and you are boldly approaching the throne of grace. I just want to take you, before I get into the I wills of Jesus, I want to take you to 1 John, if you'll go there with me, in the fifth chapter. Let's look at it together tonight as we do this little study on the I wills of Jesus. Please hear this word, 1 John, the fifth chapter, verse number, let's take a look at verse number 14. In verse number 14, it says these words. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. Notice the capital H in the word him, speaking of Jesus. Now, this is the confidence. This is how you get your God big. Watch this. This is how God becomes bigger than your problems. Can I just say this to you? When God is bigger than your problems, whew, your problems have got to run off because God's coming in to help you. He says, this is the confidence that we have in him that if, here's the biggest little word in the Bible, the word if. It's a transitional, it's an optional word, it's a pivotal word. It means you can do it or you can't do it. A lot of times we don't realize when we hear this, if means it's your call. If means it's your choice. If means it's your decision. He says this, that if we ask anything according to his, notice the capital H in the word his, will. Watch this. He hears us. And we're talking about the I wills of Jesus tonight. If I ask anything according, do you see the word according up there? The word according means in the very likeness of, not exactly. It just means something that is in the character of, in the likeness of, doesn't have to be perfectly right on. It just has to be that that's the will of God. I can't ask God for something that's not his will for my life. I remember a woman coming up one time says, I believe in God for that woman, man over there. I've told you the story. And I said, what man? She said, the man in the blue shirt. I said, wait a minute, that man's married to the woman he's standing next to. She says, I know, but I'm believing God for that. Man. Let me tell you something. You can believe until the cows come home. God's not getting into it. That's not the will of God. He's already married, sister. You better, you better get your act together. So a man comes along and says, you know, I can live double standard. I can be turned on with my wife in church on Sunday and live like a, a sinner on the other days with my buddies. And let me tell you something, that's not the will of God. And if you think God's going to protect you, you've got to do the will of God. You have to understand something. He says, when you ask anything according to his will, if we ask anything, didn't just say specific things, anything that's according to his will, he hears us. Then the next verse comes along, pop it up, verse number 15. Remember, we're talking about the I wills of Jesus. Verse number 15 says, and if we know that he hears us, whatever. I love the word whatever. Could somebody say whatever? Whatever, whatever says, you know, he's not really defining what it is you're asking him about. As long as it's in the will of God, guess what? He says, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked him, uh, of him. In other words, man, that, he just gave you free will to ask something and free will to believe him to get it. 
that's pretty confident, man. When you got that kind of confidence, I want, to, I want you to know something. Nothing's going to stop you from being what God would have you to be. Nothing's going to take you off course. Nothing's going to drive you down. Listen, you, you can win this battle at every turn of the road. Why? Because we're asking according to his will. Not according to my will, not according to my feelings, not according to what the world says, not according to what some guy's lust or some woman's lust or garbage says, but according to the will of God. If you don't know what the will of God is and you're asking for stuff that is not the will of God, you're in, a, you're in error. And so you and I have got to come to a place where we know the I wills of Jesus. Because it gives us confidence to ask, confidence that knows that he hears, and if he hears, ooh, we got it. Let me tell you something, that's good. Are you listening to me now? Go back with me if you will. I'm going to take you back to the Gospels. We're going right off the bat to Luke. And now we're going to talk about Jesus' will, what he will do for your life, the I wills of Jesus. Jesus' will, number one, four things God has for you this, this night. I love all four of them. There's probably 40 of them, but I'm only going to give you four. So I give you more than four, you're going to forget it anyway. <laughs> he will clean up our lives. I want you to know no matter where you're at, you can be the biggest dirt ball on the planet. And some of us that are in this room have been the biggest dirt balls on the planet. You may not be admitting it, but I want you to know something you can't hide from it. And you know that God is the only one that can come and clean up your mind, clean up your heart, clean up your past, clean up your life. He'll clean up every area of your life. You, in other words, you do not have to remain the way you are. That's good news. You can look at yourself and say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you just don't understand. I, I have a miserable life. There isn't anything I can really see in myself. I got a lousy education. I, I, I don't have a, a, a bit of insight on how to do things. My family didn't have much of an insight on how to do things. They just kind of did things the way they wanted to do things. And, and I, I really don't fit into anywhere. I, I feel like, you know, I'm trying to get in some place. I, I want you to know something. God can clean you up. And the good news is that when God gets in the inside of you, he never lets you stay the same. I don't care who you are, what your past is, what you've done, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, whether you're one of those people that you only had a chocolate addiction or whether you have a heroin addiction, doesn't make one bit of difference, Jesus will clean you up. I thank God every day of my life that God didn't leave me the way I was. There's no hope the way you were. There's no hope the way I was. But God got into my life and he will clean us up. And Jesus is in the cleaning house business. Which gives me great hope. Hope that I don't have to look at tomorrow and say, that's the only thing I'm going to ever have. Hope that I don't have to be there and think that I'm just going to get by. Hope that, I, I mean, I have great hope because God's not finished with any of us yet. That's good news. God will clean us up and clean up every area of our lives. Clean up the filthy thinking. Clean up the vulgar attitudes. Clean up the filthy mouths. Ooh, somebody ought to give me an amen on that one. <laughs> I know you live in San Bernardino. I know what your mouth is like. I hear it when you pass me on the freeway. <laughs> See, God is amazing, isn't he? He cleans us up. He doesn't leave us the same. Sometimes we just judge our lives by where we're at today. Let me tell you something. When you get God in, don't stop with where you're at today. Tomorrow's a better day with God. And he's in the cleaning business. I'm talking about he is the merry maid of everybody. <laughs> Wants to clean us all up. Look at what he says in the fifth chapter of Luke. Let's check it out by the word of the Lord. Verse 12 says, And it happened that when he was in a certain city, and behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. And he fell on his face and implored him. Stop right there. This is such, such, such a cool vision. Leprosy is something that was just as bad as it could be. It, and the, the worst thing, it, it separated you from everything. 
It was a disease that ate you away. When you finally got full of leprosy, everything falls off, arms, ears, eyes, uh, everything, fingers fall off. When you are full, then eventually you just die. You are literally live rotting, rotting alive. It is the worst disease, it was contagious, and you couldn't get near a leprosy, a, a leper. And you'll find he is doing something. He sees Jesus. He falls on his face and he implores him. In order for you and I to have a life change, this is not just something that happens overnight. It's not just something because you go to church once in a while. It's not just something because, you know, you're, you're a nice person. It's not something because some pr stupid preacher in the pulpit tells you this is the way it is. Let me tell you something. We, listen to the attitude of this man. This attitude of this man is he fell at the feet of Jesus and he begs Jesus. The word implore means this in the original text. It means that he is deeply, deeply desiring something from the inside. When you deeply, oh hear me now, when you deeply desire something from God from the inside, you're going to get it. But don't just come along and throw some little token prayer at him and say, where is it? How come it doesn't happen? Or I went to church last month. I went to Easter 2010. How come it didn't happen? You know what I mean? It doesn't happen that way. Here he is with this passionate desire. And he falls on his face. And he, he's got his face on the ground. And he's begging Jesus. Now Jesus is just the same to every person in here as he is to that man. If we've got that kind of an attitude towards Jesus, I promise you, whatever it is that you are desiring of God, you will get. You may not get it overnight like this man's going to get, but you will eventually get it. You, some of you may not even want it when you get it, but <laughs> you're going to get it. It has a lot to do with how you approach God on whether or not you get anything from God. If you approach God like he's some slot machine in the sky and you just think you can throw some token thing at him and he's like the puppy dog that you call and command around, you're mistaken. But when you are prostrate before him with weeping and tears and coming from your heart, you've got to have it. You've got to have him. You've got to have what he's got to give you. You've got to have it. Listen to this. He is before Jesus. He had to have what Jesus had in order for him to exist. He is somebody with a deep passion is not just going through the system we've got too many people in Christendom that just go through a religious system we got to get out of the system and get into Jesus and he says these words Lord if you are willing you can make me clean and Jesus says the next, ver the next part of that verse go to the last part of that verse and he says these words. Verse 13. Then he put his hand and touched him. Put out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. That same thing with Jesus wants to clean up your act. What is it you're addicted to? What is it that controls you? What emotional problem do you have that you've got to get over? You can do it with Jesus. I heard someone preaching just the other day about Romans, the seventh chapter. So ticked me off, I'm yelling at my radio all the way. So ticked me off. Go to Romans 7 chapter, Paul's writing, I can't do this because my, my flesh has got me and taken me down. You know, you, you got to get to the place, that's the way you used to be, when your flesh run you. But now the last part of that... Romans 7 chapter says, but Jesus, I got into God and God set me free. Man, I'm telling you guys, something, guys. There, there's not just staying the same. There's a change coming. God wants to clean up your act just like he cleaned him up from leprosy. Whether it's the disease you have, whether it's the sickness you have, he's not a respecter of men, but you're going to have to get down and you're going to have to realize it's him that you get it from. And he gives it to those that really want it, not just someone who calls him like a dog and expects him to come running and fetch the bone. It doesn't work that way. Boy, I'll tell you, it's those that are meeting with him on the level that he needs to be met with, that he is God Almighty, and we need to get our hearts before him. Are you hearing this? 
and he'll clean us up. It's like the thousands and thousands of people that come forward. Where are they? What happened to them? You just can't walk down the aisle and get saved and that's it and forget about God and think you're saved. Don't think for a moment God doesn't see where you're at. You ought to be on your face before God crying out to him, God, I got to have you more than anything and you'll get him more than anything. Is anybody listening? That's number one. He will. I will, Sir Jesus, I will cleanse you. Number two, I like this. He will draw the people. The Bible says he will draw all men. He says, I will draw all men. One thing you got to know about Jesus, the one who draws men, his name is Jesus. The one who brings men out of where they're at. Sometimes we look at this world and we think there's no hope. Can I tell you something? In the natural, there's no hope. But we're not putting the natural against the world. We've got a supernatural God who will draw people out. And you can say anything you want about the billboards and you can write me all the texts you want and you can send any letter you want and you can complain about everything. But I'm here to tell you something. The billboards will never draw people to Jesus. Jesus draws people to himself. The billboards only open the door so they can go through to Jesus. And that's what this is all about. We're investing in just the open door. We need to know that he will, number one, cleanse us, but number two, he draws all men when he is lifted up. And our job at the church is to lift him up. We lift him up on the job. We lift him up wherever we go. We lift him up in our lifestyle. We lift him up in school. We lift him up in business. We lift him up in our home. We lift him up in our family. We lift him up with our children. We lift him up with our finances. We lift him up in the marketplace. We lift him up because anytime he's lifted up, he will draw men to him. And what we're doing with this shout is we are lifting up Jesus. I like what it says. Go with me in John, the 12th chapter. When you get to John, the 12th chapter, look at verse 30 with me. And Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. How is the judgment of this world? Now is the judgment of this world. Now the rulers of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. One translation says, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. Our job is to realize that Jesus will draw men to himself. You didn't get here tonight by yourself. Oh, you need to hear this. You didn't get here tonight by yourself. You didn't get here because someone talked you into it. You didn't get here because you uh, decided to come. You got here because the Holy Spirit drew you here. And if the Holy Spirit can draw you here, how much further could he draw you into the place where he wants you? Because the Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. So God draws you in and takes you where he needs to take you. I like that. We're talking about what Jesus will do, the I wills of Jesus. He will draw people. He will cleanse our lives. Number three, he's coming again. You better believe he's coming again. I don't know when he's coming. If anybody ever tells you they know the date and the hour and the time, they're squirrely and nuts because the Bible said those kind of people are nuts and they're not going to be able to know the date or the time or the hour. So I want you to know something. When you hear about some guy prophesying that the day is coming on a certain, certain day at a certain, certain time, just sit back and laugh because it will not be that time. But I want you to know he is coming. I don't know if he's coming today or tonight or tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. My job as a pastor is to get you ready because Jesus will be coming. And that's good news. 
I love what it says. Take a look at it with me in John the 6th chapter. Excuse me, in John the 14th chapter. Sorry, John the 14th chapter, verse number 1 says it like this. Let not your heart be troubled, you. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare, prepare a place for you. Jesus is speaking. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will. Everybody say, I will. I will, I will come again and receive you myself. And there I am And there you may be also. There's hope for our future. Jesus is coming. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. We're talking about the I wills of Jesus. Number one, he will cleanse you. Number two, he will draw men. Number three, he will come. Number four, I love this one, my favorite one and last for tonight. He'll not leave us behind. Wouldn't it be terrible if he came but left you and I behind? The only ones that are going to be left behind are those that are not going to be hooked up with Jesus. And if you think at that last moment when he comes, you can talk your way in. I'm I'm sorry, I don't care how good a talker you're in. It is over and you missed it. And he's not going to leave us behind. Notice what it says in John, the 6th chapter, verse number 39. It says, this is the will of the Father. 6th chapter, verse number 39. This is the will of the Father who sent me. That of all he has given me, I should not lose nothing, but should raise it up in the last days. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. Listen to this. And I will raise him at the last day. Man, good news is you don't have to stay. There's a day coming when Jesus is coming. The eastern sky is going to split. And we're going to know the king of glory has come. And we that know and believe, let me tell you something. We're not staying behind. We're not left behind. We're out of here because we're connected with Jesus. And you ought to give the Lord a great big praise. All of this builds confidence in you as to who you are. In him, if you're born of the Spirit of God, if you're not, guess what? I'll help you in a moment. In him, this builds this confidence that you know he's not leaving me the same. He's going to cleanse me and clean me up. He will draw all men and he will draw me to him and I will follow him. He's one who's coming again. Thank God. And he's also number four. He's not leaving me behind. That's good news. And that builds the confidence. And that's a Bible study you can go to the bank on. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. The I wills of Jesus. If he will for them, he will for you. Let's talk about some of you right now. Because God's in this house. I told someone the other day, why is the rock, he asked me the question, why do people come to the rock? I said, because Jesus comes to church here. It's his church, why wouldn't he come? He's welcome, we love him, we worship him. That's a healthy, strong place. But before I go any further, there's those of you that need to give your life to Jesus, and tonight's your night, simple as that. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. Tonight, God brought you here. You have a divine appointment with God. You've had a lot of appointments in your life, painters, plumbers, physicians, dentists. Tonight, you have an appointment with God. Tonight is your night of salvation. All across this auditorium tonight, Jesus wants to cleanse you. But you're going to have to get into that place, not just mentally for him, like that man who had leprosy. It wasn't a mental thing. He put his face on the ground and he begged him. And Jesus didn't turn him back. There had to be a heart thing in that. All of you that are in here, I want you to check yourself out. Take a few moments, just examine yourself. Nobody will know but you and God. Nobody. But I want to ask you this question before the night's over. 
question is a simple question. And I want you to answer that simple question in your heart. Again, nobody will know but you and God, so take the time to do it. If you were to walk out of this building and head towards your car and your heart stopped and you died tonight, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Hell's a very real place according to the Bible. Whether you believe it or not, does it make it go away? It's a very real place. Jesus talked about it. Will you go to heaven if you die tonight or will you go to hell? So let's talk. What makes you think, all of you, you're going to go to heaven? Some of your answers will really indicate where you're at. Some of you said, well, I hope that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I hope I'd make it. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to hope your way into heaven. You're not going to make it and somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, you just don't understand, Pastor Jim. I, I love God a whole lot. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God, you get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you that are in here are saying to yourself, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm really a pretty good person. I get along with society, social system. I give my money to charity. I've taken care of people. I really care about people. I try to be kind, nice to people. I'm glad you do. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible it says because you're good, you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it if you think that's going to get you in heaven. And somebody needs to tell you before it's too late. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I'm going to go to heaven because my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. Well, they took me to catechism class and Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. You know, they had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Great, but could you show me that in the Bible? Because it's not in the Bible. It says your mom and dad tell you Christian makes you Christian. No, not in the Bible. Can you imagine that? Have you christened or baptized when you were a baby? Took you to those classes? You know, those ones that bored your brains out? Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible is that in the Bible. Get you to heaven. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I joined my last church. I was there for years, Christian church, sang in the choir, helped the pastor out. You know, I, I, I was a leader in that church, taught Sunday school. Didn't that make me a Christian? I'm glad. But guess what? Nowhere in the Bible says you join the church, sing in the choir, help the pastor out, become a leader in a church. You get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. Jesus who goes to the cross, a beaten, bloody mess for you and I, dies on that cross, raised from the dead on the third day, proved to be the son of God. Everything he's ever said for thousands of years has come to fact. To a fact, it's true. Proved itself over and over again to be true. There's not one contradiction thing in the scripture that hasn't proved itself. For thousands of years, there's not another book written like it anywhere in the world. Proved himself to be the son of God. Goes to the cross, dies for you and I so that we could receive him as our Lord and Savior. And when we do, guess what happens? Life starts to change. Now hear what I'm going to say to you because it's very important to you. He tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture, John the third chapter. He says you must be born again. Now a lot of people get mad at that word born again because movies in Hollywood have made people look like idiots and radicals and fanaticals and goofballs. But here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart it means you've given God all of your life. Just like that leper who faced down and pouring, begging Jesus. You don't have to do that tonight, but you got to give him all of your heart. you got to give him all of your life because it's not about what you have in your head that gets you into heaven. You see, I already know, and so does Jesus, that you know who Jesus is in your head. Every year you've celebrated Christmas and Easter, Every year you've heard about the resurrection, you heard about the baby in the manger. Every year of your life, you know who Jesus is, but that won't get you to heaven. Even the devil knows who Jesus is, and that doesn't make him a Christian. So it's not what you have in your head, it's what you've done, watch me now, with your heart. And tonight, here you are, in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed, we've sung, we've heard the word of God, we heard the I wills of Jesus so you can have the confidence to make your petitions known so you can get answers to prayers. And tonight is your night. 
But in order for him to cleanse you, you're going to have to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. And that's what born again means. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches. We've watered that down for 250 years. But it's all or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Last book, Jesus himself is speaking. He said, I'm coming again, and you, you know he is. He says, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What did he just really say? Here's what he really just said. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. Let me repeat myself. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and are going to get vomited out of the mouth of Jesus. He said, I better find you hot or cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Let's define lukewarm. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God. Watch this, watch this. But you're not wholehearted for God. Watch this. God is something in your life but he's not everything. And he'll never be something until you make him, and you have to do this, you have to make him everything. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. Here we are in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung songs. You heard the word, you are great listening to the word of the Lord tonight. Don't go another moment without Jesus. Give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Did you hear that? He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you before my Father. That's what Jesus said. You're going to have to confess him before men. I'm a man. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. I go, bang, when you hear that sound. Bang, your hand goes up. Hands are already going up. Hold on, we'll do it all at the same time. Is that okay? We'll do it all at the same time. Because tonight is your night of salvation. God drew you in this place to start making that relationship real tonight. Tonight. Don't run from it. Don't fight it. Let it happen. Give God all of your heart. Give God all of your life. Be born again, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. I'm going to count to three. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God speaking to you? If you've never given him all of your heart, if you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure. I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're saying to yourself, well, I... I, I, you know, I prayed that prayer with Billy Graham on television, or I prayed at a Harvest Crusade, great, but did you follow up the prayer with all of your heart, or was it just a magical formula that you repeated, and now you think mentally that you're saved because you said the right formula of words? It's not about the formula of words called a prayer. It's about your heart. Have you given God really all of your heart and all of your life? Tonight, God drew you in this place to make a difference in your future because he loves you. And it's your call, not his, it's yours as to whether or not you will receive him. I'm counting to three, here it is. I'm popping my hands together. Hands are already going up. Hold on, here it is, here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands, let me see your hands. Thank you, there's one, thank you. There's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, thank you. There's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, thank you. God bless you, 16, God bless you. Got you back there, you can put it down. Sweetheart's had her hand up for the last 10 minutes wanting to get right with God. Anybody else, God bless you. Man, she like that leper saying, I want, anybody else, there's like 10 of you already. There's somebody else back over here. 
back over here. Some wave at me because I can't see your blade. Oh, there you are. God bless you. 11 of you. God bless you. Another one back here. Another one. 12. God bless you. I got you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's a dozen of you that want to go for Jesus. In the family rooms, ushers, anybody in the family rooms, just wave at me if you're in the family room and you need to get right with God. Tonight's your night. Anybody else? There's another one. 12, 13, 14. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. All 14 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. This is your time. If you're in the family room, bring your children. If you raised your hand. I don't want anybody to leave during this period of time. That's rude, and you need to have some church etiquette and not be rude in church. But I want all 14 of you that raise your hand, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 of you. I want you to get out of your seat, get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. If you're serious about God, if you're serious about God, like that leper was serious about God, I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. Come on, it's your night. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. Let's give them a hand as they come. You come right now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. You come too, come on. Hurry, just grab your stuff and get down here. They're still coming, come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, you come too, come on. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Thank you, Jesus. God's going to clean up your act. Ooh, is it going to be good? All of you, put a smile on your face. You're going to go to heaven, not hell. You're not going to the morgue. You're going to heaven. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. <laughs> okay, here's what I want you to do. I want all of you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? It's Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave, a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. You know how you go to church, you think, oh, maybe they're really weird. You know, they're really freako stuff. Only when Debbie preaches, it gets weird. <laughs> I'm cool, you know what I mean? So, now, nah, I'll, 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 so. Pastor Dave is the nicest guy in the whole world, and he's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free stuff to take home and read about what to do next. Now that you're a Christian, you know, what does God expect from you? Number three, he's going to introduce you to a spiritual, personal trainer. See all these wonderful people behind you? They're friends that they'll meet with you before church, pray for you during the week, encourage you to keep going on with Jesus. You need a friend to help you keep going. If you go back, you're going to fall through the cracks. You're going to go back with your old buddy. He's going to suck you down the tube, use you up, and spit you away, and lie and cheat on you. Now let's go on with God, with God's people, and watch God just bless your future. Guess what? There is a future that is dynamic, that you don't even know that's ahead of you. Only takes a few moments. Uh, uh, people you came with will wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow <laughs> Pastor Dave. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Isn't God good? 